Hello everybody, this is Brayden from Academen and welcome back to another video. This is the first video I'm filming in my new office studio. Recently we went through a move and stuff like that, so uh, we're here again with my Lutheran friend Peyton, LCMS seminarian. Yes. Give a little bio if, if they didn't see the last video five months ago. Yes, yeah, for you that still stuck around, yes, I'm the same guy from five months ago. Yeah, I know despite we, this. Yeah, the right hair's there. kind of come out a bit. And yeah. I, we also said we were going to make a few more videos right afterwards, and as but, you can tell, it didn't happen, but now yeah. it is happening, so. Yes. Uh, ever since then, now I've finished my first year at seminary in uh, Concordia, St. Louis. Uh, in about a week, or a bit, little bit less than a week, I'll be heading back to do Hebrew all summer, four hours a day, five days a week for 10 weeks. That's how we did Greek, too. Yeah, I don't know did, if we did that last summer. <laughs> did that last summer oh, for God, Greek. I couldn't. So, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, the grind is real on yeah. that, so. <laughs> I'll be going back into that, but but now Braden's back in uh, in both of our hometowns, yeah. and so there's not a lot of traveling that I have to do when I get back into town. So it makes it a lot easier for us to record videos. Yes. So now we're here. Good stuff. And so in this video, we want to talk about. So actually, last video we talked about American Protestantism and just some of some of the uh, confessional Lutheran views on that. But this video, we want to talk about Catholic Lutheran differences, uh, maybe some com common ground. Uh, we're going to talk about the Joint Declaration on Justification. We've been having a lot of discussion on that recently, and we want to kind of parse out uh, what the difference is, uh, if it's a sufficient uh, declaration on um, the, the differences and the agreements there. We're maybe going to talk about the Eucharist and some other uh, differences. State of Grace, we're going to talk about that. Uh, uh, differences of, of sins. So is there anything you want to just go ahead and get out there? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a really quick, you know, information disclaimer because it'll be really helpful. And I know there were some questions of some uh, very inquisitive people on the last video. And I want to make a few things clear just so everyone knows, because when you yeah. walk into it, it's kind of hard to know, especially right. when no one says anything. I didn't make it clear on some areas, but, right. uh, I'm a confessional Lutheran in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So that's very important because a lot of people, especially in America, are going to be familiar with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA. They have more members, all that other stuff. Yeah. But they are not, by definition, confessional Lutherans. They have no standard when it comes to the Book of Concord and the Lutheran Confessions as a whole. They will say, oh, yes, we kind of use it as a guidance tool, but you can flat out say you don't agree with anything in there and still be a minister uh, they just reject right. everything that way, and, and then, of course, they have ecumenism with a lot of other groups. Right. So that's important. We are distinguished from that. Uh, there was another question I saw that was on there that on the last video that would be really important I wanted to put out there and give an answer was that it was about uh, the when I mentioned that we consider ourselves the continuation of the Catholic Church in the West. And really briefly on there, when it came to the LCMS and the question was about, oh, well, what about all these other synods? Because there are a few other like micro synods and stuff. Really quickly, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and same with technically the ELCA and other stuff, they all exist as advisory councils and advisory systems. We are bound to the sacred scriptures and to what is explained in the Book of Concord completely. So the Book of Concord explains what we would say as the best way of how scriptures are to be interpreted and the traditional aspect of that. And so the Synod has authority to have advisory systems working in it and all that, but we would say that no, it's it's not necessarily the Missouri Synod or the Wisconsin Synod or this that's the true in and of itself physical Catholic Church, the visible Catholic Church. It would be anywhere that truly believes that the Book of Concord is the right definition and, and description of the sacred scriptures because of what it is. The ELCA right. would, of course, say not because, but in, you know, if, if it so happens to line up with our understanding of it. Right. But that's, that's where you would find what we would say is the visible and the true Catholic Church is where those things are believed. Okay, so it's not so much... See, in, in the Catholic tradition, as I'm sure you know, but just for the viewers, the the um, the emphasis really is on apostolic succession. And so the, the idea that uh, bishops in a uh, clear line of succession through ordination, through the uh, through holy orders, uh, 
have a line going all the way back to the apostles. And so the, the Catholic Church is recognized in an institutional form, although it has invisible qualities. It's, it's primarily a, a visible uh, institution with in, invisible qualities. So uh, some of the ways that the, the fathers have talked about this is body and soul and stuff like that. And so would you say that it's th- those believers who might not be in like a Lutheran denomination, but who hold to like, uh, what, do, what do they call it? The chief article, chief article on justification. Right. Uh, um, that being justification by faith alone. Would you say that those are part of the Catholic church or would you say more like, well, they're not churches, sort of kind of going along with the with the Catholic view. They're not churches, but they are ecclesial communities, and there's probably believers in them who, you know, will be saved in the end. Right. That's actually really, that's really good that you ask that, because I believe C.F.W. Walther, who was the first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, for most people that wouldn't know that, um, he wrote, and a few other people wrote, that we're okay with calling anything that we would deem heterodox. We'd still say a church, even if the way they would say church. There's mm-hmm. just, like we would say the Roman Catholic Church. We wouldn't be like Roman Catholic ecclesial community we would, right. or Orthodox ecclesial community, right? A Baptist in the same way. We would still say it as if, like, okay, we have the word church there. Now, the the truth, and it was similar, you know, in the same way of how, Rome would say it, or maybe the East would say stuff on how if you the you know the truth that exists within there, mm-hmm. there's still there's still truth even though it yeah. may not be the full the fullness of the truth. Yeah, it would not yeah. have the fullness of it. So right. we both we all believe that all you know orthodox yeah. all that and everything, but we of course differentiate on how we would define it. So on your question about faith, um, yes. However, that's why there's more to it. Than faith. That's why, yeah. and I know it's. I, of course, we're justified by by grace through faith alone is the sheep right. aspect, not by faith through Apart grace. Apart from grace, yeah, oh, no. because a lot of people they flip it around by faith through grace. It's by grace through faith, and that's an important distinguishment there. But um, yeah, if you have the wrong view of that faith and you have all that kind of stuff. There's, there's some things, you know, there's a lot of redeemable qualities, but you need mm-hmm. to kind of check on how much how much would this group or more more than a group, mainly individuals, how much do they profane the gifts of God and mm-hmm. what is true? Because it's easy for anyone. Anyone can say, I mean, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, people yeah. can talk about faith, but if it's like the sacraments are profaned and I don't want to get baptized, that's not important, yeah. and you have all these other things, I don't care to go to church, it doesn't matter, I don't need any of this, then you can see that it's not really true what they're mm. saying. They're right. talking out of both sides of their mouth, per se, Right. when that happens. Right. Yeah. So uh, it seems like we're kind of going along this lines of justification, and we definitely want to get into the justification by faith, uh, joint declaration. Yes. Uh, but b- before we do that, do you want to go ahead and talk about maybe some of the, the key differences that we see in the debate between Catholics and Lutherans about uh, what justification is, how it comes, because I know uh, just looking at some of the Lutheran uh, confessional documents, you wouldn't say that justification happens by faith apart from baptism, right? Right. And obviously neither would we. We would say right. that faith justifies, and yes. you'd say faith justifies, yes. but also the, the grace is important there. You know? yes. So like from, from a Baptist background, we would always say, well, faith justifies, so obviously baptism doesn't justify. And so... How would you, if faith, faith alone justifies? So just just for those who might not be Lutheran, might not uh, believe in uh, baptismal regeneration, how would you maybe explain uh, what Luther meant about faith alone justifying, but also holding that in tandem with baptism being the instrumental or however you want to articulate right. that cause of justification? Right. So... <clears throat> for what Martin Luther meant and what we teach confessionally on this. And I know there's some variation in ways people explain it, so I'm going to try to explain it as orthodox as possible for any LCMS Lutherans that are going to watch this and go, I don't yeah. like the way he's explaining that. Oh, there's best. Peyton up there. Yeah, there I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's with that stupid Catholic again. Yeah, there you go. No. <laughs> yeah. So in baptism, baptism, of course, why it's so important to baptize infants and why it's so important to have baptism in the first place is because baptism for us bestows faith and that is where you receive the Holy Spirit. 
So of course we don't we don't believe in synergism. We don't believe which is cooperation in that aspect. There's one thing that we can agree with the reformed on technically is monergism. It's all God 100 uh, percent. Even though that kind of falls apart pretty quickly after this with baptism and everything. Yeah, we, <laughs> oh, we need to talk agree, about Calvinism yeah. sometime. Yeah, that would be know. something else. Yeah. That'd just be a whirlwind. Yeah. But <laughs> but yeah, because of that monergism, that's where baptism is where traditionally you receive faith, especially as an infant, because babies can believe. People say, well, infants can't believe. Okay, well, John the Baptist, that's, I know it's a common argument, but if John the Baptist did leap in the yeah. womb of his mother in the presence of Christ in the womb of Ma- Blessed Virgin Mary, right. then quite frankly, I don't care if it's a common argument, it's true. Right. And so you receive that faith, you receive the Holy Spirit, but we all can talk about how, well, even though baptism is necessary, we look at the absolute necessity of it, and even if someone's not baptized, they have, or they took a while to get baptized, but they were still hearing the spoken word, that's something that's pretty interesting in Lutheranism. And I, I believe it might be taught in other circles, maybe, but I don't see it explicitly taught. But mm-hmm. we pretty much routinely and flat out say that the way that salvation comes to you is only through the word. When, when you receive faith right. in that way, faith comes through hearing the word. Right. So even if, like, let's say it took maybe someone 16 years to get baptized or something, but they were hearing the word, the Holy Spirit was still working on them in, to some extent. And quite frankly, they could be without baptism their entire life uh, if they weren't profaning baptism, but they still heard the word rightly preached and true. Then what's stopping God from utilizing that aspect of, of his means of communication? Because that's the right. means in which he promised to communicate to us was through his spoken word. Okay, I see. So it, it seems like the that that position is pretty similar. So like we would say, yeah, baptism's essential for salvation because it's the instrumental means by which God intends to justify you, incorporate you into his family. And um, but for for those who might have gone their entire lives without being baptized, maybe due to lack of catechesis or lack of opportunity, or they just die before being able to receive baptism. Yeah. You would probably say and agree that with, with Catholics that God isn't bound by the sacraments, so he can have mercy on whoever he wants to have mercy on, right? Okay. Exactly. And, and it, yeah. of course it changes when someone routinely flat out profanes Right that aspect, because you know, once once you move into actively understanding it, but then denying it, then you then you completely it's a completely different topic because now right. you're actually active in rebellion. Right. Because, and I don't want to jump ahead, but if, when we get on justification, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll talk about that because you kind of already mentioned that. So I guess I'm not getting ahead. But, no, we're we're talking whatever uh, you want to talk ju- about justification. Well, yeah. Well, that's a the big thing, and I know then it's something that's disputed as well. Is that we would say. In justification, first of all, there's a big distinguishment between justification and sanctification. They're two distinct things. We don't try to confuse them. Right. As various groups probably make them a lot too similar, we would have a distinction. And then we have the whole uh, simul justus et peccator. So oh, I don't know that si- one. Simultaneously just and oh. simultaneously uh, sinner. Right. So right. and and that flows into the. The view of the state of grace differing from the state of grace in okay. Roman Catholicism, and so I and I guess it might be natural to talk about the state of grace and the state of uh, mortal sin and stuff like that after we talk about justification, because uh, as you were saying earlier, quorum Deo and yeah. quorum Mundo, mundo um, that that kind of flows from the understanding of justification and yeah. what what that means, and so maybe. Um, as you understand it, uh, parse, parse just real quickly the difference between the Catholic doctrine of justification and the Lutheran doctrine of justification. Um, and maybe just not, not how we receive justification, but what it is. And then maybe we can go into like reception. What does that mean? And because it seems like we have a lot of similarity in like res- the reception of justification, but just what it is that we receive. Yeah. yeah and so I don't stray too far into when we start talking about that state of grace aspect. Yeah. The really the core fundamental difference is going to be the cooperation when it comes to justification. Okay. So flat out, it would be only 100% the grace of God. I know you guys would say grace, but we define it a little differently in that aspect. Mm-hmm. But it will be the only actual work 
of God himself justifying us, whereas there is nothing involving good works that goes on coupled with faith and grace and justification. Now, the good works aspect is very important in the sanctification realm. Mm -hmm. And the continuing justification, the initial justification and the continuing justification doctrines in Roman Catholicism, that's where one could say, well, the continue, the similar, it's not completely the same, but similar yeah. to continuing justification in Roman Catholicism mm -hmm. would be how sanctification is seen would in you, Lutheranism. Would you say that sanctification is synergistic? Or is there like a position on that as far as you know? I, I, I know... Like there's obviously confessional documents and stuff like that. I I haven't I hadn't read yeah. anything about I, that. I guarantee there's probably some disagreement that goes on yeah, there. Yeah. Um, I I would I would have no problem with saying yes, and the reason I say yes, and and for any oh god any Lutherans that are watching, <laughs> please understand. Listen, yeah. continue to listen. War in the comment yeah. section. Yeah. Or any professors at the seminary. Yeah. yeah. All right, you're gonna get expelled. <laughs> yeah, I know. There I go. Okay. All right, just come to Holy Apostles with me. A little bit. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> no, but, um, I would say yes in a way that you, we've gotten to the point where it's the God who is regenerating us working mm -hmm. through us to do those good deeds. So yeah. therefore right. technically, yeah, it's the same way of saying, you know, we don't, we don't, we can't, we don't believe in just saying like, Oh, I just now, like right now I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and savior. We say, well, once, if you're saying that, that one action of you saying that wasn't just now accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. He already did. You're just professing what has already happened. Right. Um, and of course, people are going to disagree with that, but still, that's what we would describe it as. Right. So, in that way of synergistic um, in sanctification, mm -hmm. yes, it's just, it's not trying, it's not synergistic in the way of attaining something more from God by pleasing him in doing right. something. It's it's really working through, and you mentioned Coram Deo, Coram Mundo, with Deo, of course, dealing with God, Mundo, with the world, and the aspects of in sanctification and doing good works. It's for the help of the neighbor. It's for the people around you in the church. It's for the goodwill of those around you. Right. Okay, yeah, and so... Then we can talk about the sort of the essence of, okay, Lutheran justification. Um, as far and correct me where I'm wrong, in Lutheran justification, it, it seems like the emphasis is on the imputed righteousness of Christ. And so yes. Christ's righteousness that he um, lived out and ultimately demonstrated through the passion mm -hmm. is when we are justified, mm -hmm. imputed to our... Would you, would you guys say legal account, or is that more Calvin? I mean, there's people that will, and there's people that will avoid it, but they'll right. probably it's probably one of those that the end is pretty much similar to the same okay. without using that same means. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, there's various okay. eras in Lutheranism that probably would have used more legal language. Right. Um, in some areas that would avoid legal language because of the Calvinistic confusion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's some history there in Lutheranism as to why. Right. And there's um, a lot of that uh, the legal language in the Western Church in comparison to the Eastern Church yeah. as well, even before the Protestant Reformation. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so then the, the imputation of Christ's righteousness is to your legal account, mm -hmm. so to say that when God looks at you, um, in, in judgment, your the righteousness that uh, he judges you upon is not yours. It's an alien righteousness. Mm -hmm. It yes. was the Latin term extra nos. Is that yep. okay? Outside so, of a, yep. so a righteousness that is outside of you. It's not. It's not infused in you. In, in you, and we'll get into mm -hmm. that. Uh, that's the Catholic view: is the infusion of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So it's an imputation of righteousness. It's not something inside of you that you can destroy or affect. It's it's something that is. Christ's righteousness that is a gift to you yeah. um, and so when God judges you it's he's judging really Christ's righteousness that's imputed to your account and then do you guys uh, accept uh, double double imputation your sin is imputed to to Christ I, I keep I always uh, get the different views mixed right. up between reformed and, and Lutheran. I'm and I remember I looked into this and I asked a few questions on that and 
I don't want to be in a position of saying, I don't know. I'd rather say, I I haven't used the term, and I right. know people abstain from using the term, even though I feel like it's another one of those very similar like conclusions. Yeah. I'd rather just say, we don't really use the term. Because I don't want to yeah. say flat out yes or no and be absolutely wrong. Right. And I know it's something I probably should know more of. I just know, I mean... It's this. I mean, the fact that Christ's righteousness is imputed on onto us in the first way. That's that's a good way of distinguishing it too. Is the infusion is working in you, the imputation is just on top of you. Right. Um, then it wouldn't be wrong. I mean, it's pretty much orthodox of us to say, okay. yeah, then then therefore it's the the yeah. sins were cast out. It was kind of like a transaction in a way, but right. I don't want to use the word transaction. And we can get into like atonement <laughs> yeah. theories and stuff. Because yeah, I know Calvin weird. would say, okay, your sin is imputed to Christ while he's on the cross. And so right. God's wrath is poured out on Christ. And that's how God's wrath is right. um, is appeased. Whereas mm-hmm. it, it seems like, at least from our conversations, you would hold to more of a um, satisfaction theory. Yeah. God's, God's wrath was appeased because Christ's sacrifice was... Valuable, and that's that's where the Catholic root would be. Yeah, I, I can't. I don't know if that's. Yeah, because the the to- there's like a lot of atonement theory blending in Lutheranism instead right. of just sticking to straight up one. Right. And the yeah, the importance truly is on that actual sacrifice right on the cross, a hundred percent, and the willingness of Christ to do such a thing. Right. And of course, he's reconciling all of creation. There's none of this weird philosophical understanding that some of the reformed reformers wanted to do with, mm. with like, you know, how many seconds you stayed on the cross and the amount oh, of yeah. people saved and all that Every drop yeah. of blood. It, yeah. Not a single drop of blood was wasted. Yeah. And, it's like, it's yeah. like, those are just, those are just, you know, kind of like useless details that would burden someone's conscience. It's just the, the straight up fact that Christ died on the cross right. in place of us. Right. And that's, that's that. I mean, yeah, it's without that, that's exactly what we deserve. Without his imputed righteousness on us, that is where we would be. Right, is how we would say. So. Okay, yeah, and, and we would we would agree. Obviously, in a nuanced way, roughly, we would agree. So, summarize: imputation, Christ's righteousness. Luther described it as snow over a, a pile of dung. Yep. You're the dung. He's yep. the snow. God looks at the snow and not the dung, and exactly. it's yep. because of Christ's merits. And here's where we have agreement: Christ's merits alone are. Um, Let's let's see how to formulate this. Christ, it's Christ's merits who purchases our justification. It's Christ's merits that um, is is the cause of our justification, mm-hmm. at least initially. And so, from from the Catholic perspective, the the infusion rather than imputation of righteousness is as if God looked at this pile of dung and He turned it into snow, so that the 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 sin that's there is forgiven, but He gives you that. Righteous, and not to say that you guys wouldn't believe that the sin is forgiven, but the the righteousness that God judges you off of is a righteousness that He Himself creates within you because of Christ's merits, and so that that justification in both senses is a gift. It doesn't depend on our prior works. the The initial um, act of God justifying you is completely apart from works, and that's why some Catholics have said there's a nuanced sense in which we can affirm uh, the the doctrine of sola scriptura, although, albeit in a different sense than you would you guys would, because yeah. we would say, oh, as so long as it is a faith that is formed by charity, and you, you have Latin fathers saying the the term justification sola fide, and you know, so it's it's different different ideas of, of how that works, what does that mean? What does it does justification mean He's making you righteous, or is he declaring you righteous based off of the merits of Christ that are imputed, to, or the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to you and covering you, right? right? And so infusion, imputation, and because the Catholic view involves an infusion of righteousness, because the the just or the justice is now within you, that that leaves open the idea that it can be affected. It can affect you, but it can also be affected by the things that you do. And so, where Protestants would typically call the the process or the present experience of of salvation, sanctification, primarily, if I'm right, you would use or at least I. This is how I viewed it. Sanctification is the process of becoming more like Christ right. in, in this life, but it doesn't affect your your mm-hmm. position before before God, really. Right, and 
Yeah, and, and it, there's a lot of nuance there too. Yeah. with 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 um, new obedience is what we the new obedience, and that's okay. a little article I, I can actually read from. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. on there in a second, but um, yeah, the in the sanctification process, that's the work of the Holy Spirit because now the Holy Spirit is indwelling within yeah. us after yeah. that, and so in in. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys would reject Rome would reject the simultaneously saint, simultaneously sinner, simultaneously just and sinner when you're when you're not when you're in in a state of grace. Yeah, sort of. So I, as far as I'm aware, when you're in a state of grace, there is there is nothing that would hinder your entrance into the kingdom of God unless there's some sort of um, temporal consequence for your sin or attachment to sin that you still have within your soul. Mm-hmm. Um, but it obviously there's that passage in 1 John that talks about if anyone says that he's without sin, he's a liar, right? And so we, we would say, obviously there's a sense in which we could say we're still sinners, mm-hmm. um, but but not in the same sense that uh, Luther probably would. Mm-hmm. And so I, I would need to do a little bit more research to say could we could we affirm simultaneously just simultaneously sinner? Um, but in, in the Catholic context, it's like the sin that was within you is destroyed, mm-hmm. uh, specifically in baptism. The sin is destroyed; it's no longer on your soul. There's nothing that would hinder you to enter heaven, and then justice is infused. And so. If in in the Catholic context, justice that's within you and a mortal sin can't they can't dwell within you at the same time. Right. And so I don't I don't know if that would coincide with the Lutheran perspective of that. How would how would you maybe maybe explain more what Luther meant by simultaneously righteous, simultaneously sinner? Well, so the I mean it's going to be that perpetual state of what we're what we're in because we can't attain perfection. Right. And since Christ's righteousness is like a sheet over us. It's imputed on us. We're still in and of that sense. We're still sinners, and we still and so we're still mm-hmm. simultaneously just and simultaneously a sinner. Right. And it will hinge heavily as well on what Saint Paul talks about in Romans when he says the law of God and the law of sin are at war within him. Mm-hmm. And you know I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing that I hate. And it seems. The whole time, Saint Paul is quite frankly he's, he's distraught over it, mm-hmm. and and it's and it's almost taking him over. But at the end, what does he say? I mean, you know, uh, who will set me free? Yeah, who will set me free from this body of death? Who set me? Yeah. And then it's thanks Praise, be to God, yes, yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, right. who set so, and that kind of sums up. <laughs> that's like the best way of summing up how we would see ourselves right. as simultaneously saint and sinner, and then right. also. It's very brief, I promise. I won't oh, do this to you. But, but that's because you guys see concupiscence as sin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's an important part. Yes, we do see concupiscence as a sin. Okay. Yeah. So okay. since we see concupiscence as a sin, it's all, you're all, we're always still sinners. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I see what you mean. Here, new I'll, obedience. I'll, I'll, I'll do new obedience. Actually, I'll do justification first. It's very short okay. in the confession, but Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession, just so everyone knows, is justification. And it says, our, church, our churches teach that people cannot be justified before God by their own strength, merits, or works. People are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith when they believe that they are received into favor and that their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. By his death, Christ made satisfaction for our sins. God counts this faith or righteousness in his sight. And we reference Romans 3 and 4. Um, and so that... That sounds very similar to the Catholic perspective on initial justification. Right. And so the, the, the initial justification in Catholic theology is the moment that you are transferred from a child of wrath to a child of God, from uh, someone who is, who is before God as, as sinner to someone who's before God as just. And so like obviously right. that is completely Christ merits. God's work. There's nothing that we can do to to affect that. We we merely receive that as a gift. There's nothing that we can do to merit it. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a conversation that can be had about merit and what that means in Catholic theology. Yeah. But just to let you know, it's it's not what most people think merit is. And so yeah, there's uh, a bit of a yeah. I, I'd even admit yeah. There's a lot of people have a, yeah. a misconstrued thought. And then the other brief one in the Augsburg Confession is Article Six, which is the new obedience. So it comes right off the heels. Of Article Four, we have Article Five in there, which is whatever. But it's, a, it's, which is impo- whatever. it's important. I promise right. everyone. Everyone is important, but right. it's about the ministry. There we go. Article Six: right. New Obedience says our churches 
teach that this faith is bound to bring good fruit. It is necessary to do good works commanded by God because of God's will. We should not rely on those works to merit justification before God. The forgiveness of sins and justification is received through faith. The voice of Christ testifies, quote, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. The fathers teach the same thing. Ambrose says, It is ordained of God that he who believes in Christ is saved, freely receiving forgiveness of sins without works through faith alone. Right. And that's one of the Latin fathers that yeah. uses the, the terminology sola fide. Yes. And so, like, it's it, it's difficult, especially when we're, we're talking about, okay, it, it, very early in the Latin church, you, you see this difference between, okay, there's the initial moment that you're you're transferred, that's completely an act of God. There's nothing that you, you, you can do to merit that, obviously. We both agree on that. Yeah. And so, a lot of these things, it's like, man, if we if we... If we apply that to initial justification and Catholicism, there's hardly anything to object. Um, but then it's like, okay, the process of justification, uh, it, it, it does in Catholic theology affect your standing before God. And, and, and I think that um, this is where we might want to talk about um, uh, mortal sin, venial sin, and loss of justification. Yeah. And so in, in Catholic theology, there are... Uh, as James 5 says, there, there are sins that bring death and there's sins uh, that don't bring death. Yep. And so what, what the church has, has believed about that is the, the sins that bring death, death in, in Scripture oftentimes uh, symbolizes separation. And so you, you think of the uh, prodigal son, the, the father, when he receives his son back, he says, my son was once dead, now he's alive. And that's... that's uh, that's applied to people who have come back to the faith or to new converts. And so when you're dead, you're separated from God. Um, and, and so there's certain sins that you can do, at least in, in Catholic theology, that separate you from God, uh, that, that make you not in a state of friendship with God. And so if, if you're not in a state of friendship with God, the grace that is infused within you, that justice that's infused within you is, is somehow lost because of that sin. And so because we see justification, after initial justification, since we see justification as a process, the, the current experience of that justification being affected by the things that we do, we, we say that there are ways in which we can grow in justification and do works to grow in justification. As you guys would say that you can do works that um, grow your holiness or sanctification, Sanctity. your sanctity. Um, and, but, but again, there's that difference. Do the things that you do affect your justice for, before God? Obviously, in a system that affirms the imputed righteousness of Christ, there's nothing that you can do to increase that because his merits, his justice is already perfect. There's nothing that you can do to decrease, affect it, because it's already done, it's already imputed to you. Um, so how would you maybe articulate uh, the idea? Well, first of all, let's ask this. Do you guys believe that you can lose justification in a sense, like can you can you go from being appearing just before God and and then not appearing just before God? And how how would that work in comparison to the you can grow in justice be, because it's not Christ's righteous alien righteousness; mm -hmm. it's it's a righteousness that Christ infuses and creates within you. Mm -hmm. um, how how would you kind of parse that out from a Lutheran perspective? Right. Yeah, so we would we would say in that respect, like, yes, you can lose your salvation, and it's a willful rejection. And so where that distinguishment comes in, though, is how the effect of that mortal and venial sin aspect comes in. Because we do, and it's not common, even a lot of Lutherans probably aren't even aware, actually. It's one of those things that most people aren't aware of. But we do affirm a distinguishment in mortal and venial sins. Now, how that works is where it gets a little kind of dicey. But in a way of losing justification because it's imputed and it's not infused, it's not like something that, like you said once it's you can't increase you can't do anything right. it 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 comes into that rejection of faith and that's what okay. everyone hears is rejecting faith is losing your justification but how does one reject faith or how does one do all that kind of stuff and it really the best way it's been described and the best way that you know mortal sins and venial sins is in that way of the more sins because we're already simultaneously just and sinner the more of these, let's just say, mortal sins you're committing are going to have a more negative 
effect on your faith. And right. we're still kind of anchored down. And this is a good analogy. And I kind of talked about this with a few of my friends at the seminary. But let's just assume that the imputed righteousness is like a white sheet over you. And you're committing mortal sin after mortal sin. And once I've committed a mortal sin, I haven't fallen out of the state of grace where this white sheet of Christ's righteousness is just ripped off. I have hampered myself, same with venial sins. I'm still hampering myself in a way, but I can still rely on Christ's work that he's done, his righteousness, and that he still has me. However, the more and more, let's just say you're committing those mortal sins, the more and more you get fed up, per se, with this thing that's bothering you, this white mm. sheet on you, because now, in the act of committing mortal sins, well, you're putting yourself at odd, at odds with God. And right. when committing sins, of course, with repentance and truly understanding that and, and, and turning away, yeah, that doesn't, it impacts you a little bit, but God, Christ works on you, God works on you. But the more you just keep up with it, well, yeah, I'm like, God, like, get this thing off me. I don't want this. And then enough of it makes you throw that off. So okay. That's the, kind of the analogy I kind of use. You just, you've thrown that righteousness off of you. You've done every way to reject God, even though it was there mm -hmm. because of this sin that you've been living in. And that, once you got to that point, you've just rejected faith. Okay, so the throwing off of the the imputed righteousness mm -hmm. of Christ corresponds to faith no longer being something that you possess? Is it is it like faith being thrown out the window and then the justice going with it? So the thing is, is when Christ died on the cross, I mean, his death was a justification for all of creation. And so he wants to reconcile all of creation with him anyway. Okay. So, and it's not, it's not universalism. The fact that, because... I mean, you guys would even say that. You guys would love that because justification, you know, the difference is in that. But right. still, it's not universalism, but every time someone asks me about justification, I go, yeah, I was justified. Look back at the cross. You know, right. I, look, I was justified 2,000 years ago. <laughs> no. But yeah. that justification still exists, and I have still – see, this is where it can get finicky because people like to word it differently, but I think it's a lot clearer just to say you lose it. But in a probably right way of talking to someone would be that, well, no, Christ's death was – truly a justifying for me i was still justified but still even though i'm justified in a sense of it's been done for me in that way i've still rejected it and so therefore that ju that real justification now has no effect in the same okay. sense of how and i and we can get into this about another discussion but it's in the same sense of how we talk about communion and the sacraments mm, and the eucharist right. and all that so It'd be in that way because we 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 don't believe in ex opera operato. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So, see, it's like... So I mean, maybe we could yeah. even just kind of segue there. Yeah. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, ex opera operato just means that the, the, the sacraments communicate grace. Uh, they, they, they produce grace and, and offers it to you just just because of the work being performed uh, on account of the work being performed so it's attached to the promise of Christ and instituting uh, the 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 right the the sacrament um, and, and so it doesn't depend on the holiness of the minister it doesn't de depend on the holiness of the recipient although there's there's a sense in which the the um, the effect of the grace is is dependent upon your disposition. So if you're disposed towards receiving grace, um, then then you will have you will receive a benefit from that sacrament uh, more so than someone who is not in a worthy disposition. And it might actually produce uh, condemnation, as First Corinthians talks about yeah. uh, receiving unworthily the Eucharist. And, and so the ex opere operato is just the sacraments work just because of the, the, the work performed, not because of um, the, the merits of, of the person who's performing the sacrament or the person who's receiving the sacrament. It's just because of Christ's promise and Christ's power, of, uh, Christ's power, uh, power of the Holy Spirit and, and things of that nature. And so, so when I, you say you reject ex opere operato, what, what would that be? Well, because we would full on say, well, yeah, whenever someone is, when you come up to partake in the Eucharist, everyone is truly receiving 
the body and blood of Christ there okay. with the bread and wine. It's truly physically seen that. Unlike Calvinism, which would say only the elect actually receive right. it, and then the ones who are not elect are just they're not they're not partaking in a spiritual presence. They're just eating bread and wine. Right. We would say no. You're absolutely everyone's eating it. It doesn't have any of now the ex opera operato ex opera <laughs> operato. It doesn't. We we reject um, Donatism. Right. We're, we explicitly right. reject that, and like the minister didn't have to be perfect and everything. But if if um, you're, since you're receiving it, if, if you receive it worthily, I mean you're you're receive you're absolutely receiving all of the uh, good qualities of what the Eucharist is. Right. But if you if there's if you have not if there's unrepentance, any unrepentance, right. or or you just kind of don't believe that it is the body and blood of Christ. You're absolutely mm-hmm. eating and drinking damnation upon yourself, right? And like exactly, Catholics would yeah. say that too. Yeah. Like, just the 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 effectiveness, mm-hmm. the efficiency of the sacrament mm-hmm. isn't like it. It works whether you um, you are receiving worthily or not. That's that's more so. The, we we would we would agree that your disposition matters. You receiving yeah. it in faith matters in a state of grace. Mm-hmm. That all matters. But it doesn't. It doesn't affect the uh, efficacious nature of the sacrament. So it's not like you go up there. You don't have. You, you're you're rejecting God in your heart, and you receive. You don't. You don't receive benefits, right? You, because your disposition isn't isn't the correct yeah. disposition, isn't there? So it seems like there's some. Like obviously there's a nuance, but it seems yeah. like there's some crossover. Obviously, like we would both say, Calvin's view, spiritual presence that Christ is not. Christ is only present in in the. In, I won't. I won't get into that because I. Yeah. I want to study on that more. Um, but it's very interesting. It, it is interesting it's and kind of strange. But yeah, in a nice way. No, there is an area. I know. I, everyone probably sees me keep looking down, so I'm trying to. Yeah, hold it up for stuff. them. Show, yeah. show them your. In my book of Concord. Kind of looks. My readers, looks really cool. My reader's edition. Oh yeah, so there it is. There we go. <laughs> boom, boom. So I'm, I'm looking through it so I can actually not disappoint people and give them the wrong information because <laughs> right. I can admit oh, people I like are to, already down in the comments I right know, now I know they are they yeah. probably commented 10 minutes ago saying yeah. why do you have <laughs> this guy on here yeah but right I I like to think I know a lot of things and I do actually but I don't want to be wrong for <laughs> right. everyone I, I care enough to give you good information right. so um, there was something I saw that said ex opera operato which is why I mentioned it in the first place right. and I lost it oh. so now, now I look now All I'm right, let's look it up. Stuff that I can't find. So, um, oh yeah, of the mass. The internet, yeah. Oh the yeah, internet. that probably would be in the in the mass section. Yeah. This is such a good website, dude. I know. I love it. Okay. Uh, Bookofconcord.org. Yeah. Everyone go to. Yes, it. go to it, guys. <laughs> Reject it. Put it on your block list for no. Okay. No. Okay. Do what is it? Uh, it should be. In, yeah. The there it is. Bar for it. Yeah, yeah. When applied on behalf of it merits for them the remission of or guilt. Wait. Oh, I think this is talking about. Um, I think it's talking mass about, for the dead. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that that that's probably where it's confirmed. Yeah. So yeah, we we reject we reject requiem masses. All you trad cats. You know. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I hate to. I'm not trying to go after you yet. When applied on behalf of others, it doesn't confer grace ex opere right. operato. Because the mass isn't that sort of sacrifice, but you guys would still say that the mass is, is, a, is a is a sacrifice yeah. in a sense, just yeah. not the same. It's way. not the same. Not yeah, not in the same way. Yeah, right. and it, and it kind of and it goes into more of that being that that is, and I don't want to I don't want to represent Rome incorrectly on this, but right. it really is it really is like the priest, if you would say it really is the priest. You know when when elevating the elements mm. and, it, and then it you know you'd say it completely becomes the body and blood but it's really elevating in that in that moment the the sack the you know unbloody sacrifice yeah but yeah. like almost like to god again kind oh of yeah. yeah yeah so so ours would say well no like like is god then working like through the minister in that way where it's the body and blood we really we do believe in real presence true presence body and blood um together in with and under the elements of bread and wine but that is where god is with the word of course because it's like the same baptism words attached to it it now being the body and blood of christ is now not us raising up another sacrifice an unbloody sacrifice that sacrifice for Mm -hmm. god but instead it is now raised up 
it's made into the body and or it, the body and blood are attached to it, and then now it's a gift. It's just a, it's just a gift that's now right. given to us. Man, there's so, so like there's. There's vlogging. waves of crossover that, you know, yeah. when I hear you talking about, it, I'm just like, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it's definitely in. And so from the Catholic perspective, gosh, I wish we had more time. We should do a video just on the Eucharist. Yeah, because we can talk a lot. Well, we gosh, can talk a lot about man, and we only We don't have that much time either. Yeah. Dang it. <laughs> on adoration and stuff we can talk about too. Because oh, yeah. We, we, of course, you're not going to hear a lot of people that get really intensely mad at it now. But it, uh, there was a, even though we reject it. There is still a really concerted, like a, a big concerted effort, especially during the Reformation period, where there was a lot of anger towards that, mainly mm. because of the the right view we have. Sorry, but the right uh -oh. view that we have of uh, the fact that because it's that gift that's given to us, mm -hmm. and still people would say, "Well, no, we're honoring." Like Rome would say, "No, we're honoring the actual body of Christ." Right? We say, "Well, it's a gift given to us, and that gift is so that we can consume the literal body and blood of Christ, so that God literally within us." is forgiving sins and strengthening our faith. Right. So there's no need and there's nothing more that we need to get out of having a monstrance and adoring a host that is now said to be the body of Christ whenever it's given. It's just, we, we take it, we, we just want, we, we should really quickly and earnestly every time we see the true body and blood of Christ want to consume that. Because right. of it being given to us for the purpose only of consuming. I see what you mean. It, it obviously, like, I'm not saying let, that let's Rome say profanes anything. Oh, I'm like, like taking it now. I would say that I, I do think that adoration is uh, Eucharistic abuse. Okay. All right. Well, let's look into ba uh, Saint Basil's dove and and stuff like that a little yeah. bit later on. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, but the and obviously we would say that. The, the Eucharist is is the the chief act of worship. It's the it's the um, ordinary way and the normative way that we receive sanctifying grace for uh, the edification of the church, for building up um, all, all these things. And, and that that is that act of reception of the Eucharist is is far more beneficial, far more important than adoration would be. Because right. ador adoration is it, it involves a developmental understanding of okay, so this is this this consecrated host. We're gonna uh, what if what if we what if we keep some? What if we um, retain some? Or maybe there's some left over. I, I need to look into like the development of adoration. But the the Lutherans would say that the the host is consecrated for the service for reception, mm -hmm. but it ceases to be um, the truly Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity after the liturgical service. Is that is that the case, or would you just say consume all of it, there's none left over? We'd say we don't know. Okay. So therefore, okay. therefore, what we do, act, what, well, there's people that do various different things. Um, okay. The practice at our parish and my parish in Tulsa and then many, many LCMS parishes is to consume everything right there. Right, right. Um, because we don't know. And if we don't know, then we don't want to profane the body right. and blood. There's in no any de way. deconsecrating yeah, liturgical no, no, action. It's not like, yeah. yeah, and there's people who have tried to argue within the church every now and then, try to argue points of well, you know, maybe at this point it becomes. But then it, that just turns into a philosophical argument, right. and that becomes the same. It becomes the same problem as what we would say we have with the doctrine of transubstantiation oh, okay. and other stuff because of the the just the blunt philosophy behind it right. that is trying to be argued instead of what it really is in its essence yeah yeah okay i got you so yeah, it, yeah development of Eucharist. and let's just because we've we've really got to go let's let's end <laughs> off going sorry. back to justification yeah, we got to do a video on on the eucharist yeah we do uh do you want to okay so state of grace mm -hmm. loss of salvation yeah. mortal venial sins and justification those all kind of go together in the <laughs> same sort of thing mm -hmm. um so what what should we address before we before we sign off? Well, I can mention I can mention really quickly that anyone that because I've seen a few people mention this in the last video, but the LCMS rejects the joint declaration on justification. Oh, yeah. So yeah, if you see anything that that is with the World Lutheran Federation, this is yeah, the joint declaration. Yeah, that was with the World yeah. Lutheran Federation. So that's that that's the group that um, the ELCA is part of. So 
um, I got you. women bishops, transgender bishops, all that kind of stuff. They had, and I, so. I almost wonder, <laughs> did did those all of the mainline Protestant denominations have just gone to crap yeah. recently? It just sucks, and it's I, I don't I'm not familiar enough with modern movements like liberalizing movements. Mm -hmm basically heretical movements yeah. um, that, that are an offspring of those mainline denominations. But this was back in 1985. And then... So they... So, so I'm, not, I'm not sure if that was before or after the, the split over homosexuality. Yeah, and, and it's also, for us, unlike... It was right, it was right after. Um, okay, right. Well, it was, it, was, it was actually over women's ordination first. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is always... A, that's always the first. I mean, anytime someone says, "Well, we want it, we want women's ordination," it's right. always going to lead to other worse things. Right. Maybe that's bad enough. Right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but really briefly on that, a lot of groups like um, United Methodist Church and um, your Presbyterians, the PCUSA, other groups, you had all the main mainline churches go really liberal, and then the split offs. So the Global Methodist Union or whatever it's called, and then the PCA and all the other groups, uh, those groups, the conservative ones are the ones that split away. And the LCMS, it's the opposite. The LCMS was the, for us, that, that was the traditional vein. The Missouri Synod's existed since its inception in the 1800s. But the ELCA was founded when, um, it was it was years, it took a while actually. I think it was founded after this actually. It was founded like in the 90s, like early oh, okay. 80s or late 80s or early 90s right but it was when it was uh, there were a group of people that walked out the seminary there's a whole big thing but they had their own little synod and they found a few other liberal synods and then they founded themselves together and they merged into what is now the elca so right. um the lcms is technically the mainline denomination actually so it's the only one right. so the lca is is just evil and does all their stuff with Oof. all their stuff. I, yeah, I know. Gosh. Yeah. They do all their stuff and but but no, they're not the mainline ones. So right. it's interesting. Right. But they have more people. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's the that's the kicker. And so like and the the common statement is really very short. So there's the there's the history of the question, there's the declaration and stuff. Um, and, and the declaration of the common statement is very, very short towards the end of that uh, chapter in here. It's on page 74. And it's, it's notably broad. And so, like, I'm sure that you and I would have no particular problem with the ideas in the just, – just this declaration. Like, just uh, for example, uh, it's – we, we receive salvation not through our own initiative. It's it's the work of the Holy Spirit. We respond to the call, but only through an undeserved gift. And that gift of faith is granted. We would both say that and made known in faith. And then uh, the gospel frees us in God's sight from slavery to sin. We are willing to be judged by it in all our thoughts and actions. Uh, we've encountered the gospel in our church's sacraments and liturgies. Uh, so like it's, it's, it's notably broad so that... You can both accept it in a sense, but once you start nuancing those positions, understanding, okay, what do we mean by this? That's where it gets where where it gets difficult, and it's it's hard to say. Like yeah. for those who don't who haven't read the Joint Declaration um, or who have just heard about it and think, oh, well, Catholics and Lutherans just just agree on justification now. It's like no, there's there's fundamental differences: infused righteousness, imputed righteousness, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, um, and, and and the things that go along with that. But then it's like. Okay, we both agree Christ merits our justification. We both agree that uh, when we when we transfer from a state of of wrath to a state of friendship with God, that act is is Christ is by Christ's merits alone. We have no merits. There's nothing. There's nothing that we can work to produce that within ourselves. It's God's act for us. Mm -hmm. That that in that sense of God justifying us, it's monergistic. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing that we can do to cooperate to produce that within us. That initial act. But it's like it's so broad that it's like, how useful really is this? Because it seems like it produces more. Uh, confusion yeah. is that your experience that's what i would say and it also is not really good at representing either side because i wish i came more prepared with the actual quotes i found right. in there and i just don't have them so my apologies but i can link that article yeah, yeah, in the description okay. if you want that you okay. sent me that'd be good yeah oh yeah because there's some good stuff on yeah. there some but both sides at multiple areas 
completely, they say things that completely contradict established doctrine from both sides. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not as bad for the so-called Lutheran side because it's already a group of Lutherans that don't really, in my opinion, at the time they probably cared a little more, but now they definitely have a lot less of a, they have a loose view of it. But it's really mm -hmm. bad for Rome's side because if, I mean, to, to have people, you know, priests and bishops that are saying things that are not indicative of official Catholic right. dogma is just going to cause confusion. And I think, and you see, you're going to see a lot of people um, and people that are watching this that are actually, that were around during this time, there was a lot of buzz around a Lutheran ordinariate becoming a thing similar to the Anglican oh, yeah. ordinariate. Right. And I think this might have been somewhat of that broadness and everything might have yeah. been somewhat of a way of trying to wiggle in the opportunity to get enough people to kind of come together and get a Lutheran ordinary going. But then soon after this, you started to see the actual divide. And then a few years later is when all the stuff with homosexuality oh, yeah. and all the stuff came out and it completely put stuff to rest for them. Right. And, and so like, but even within, so conservative LCMS vein and then just traditional catholic vein it doesn't oh gosh my my dog's barking someone's here it, it doesn't seem like th those two are reconcilable on the issue of justification just because we affirm a an infused transformative view and you you affirm the imputed um more more like unchangeable righteousness um view and so it's like yeah, and those two views are unreconcilable unre yeah Theologically, yeah. In, so in, in the LCMS, I mean, we would and, and confessional Lutherans would say that the Joint Declaration, as it's called, is pretty much an affront to the doctrine of justification that we believe in and we claim is the true doctrine of justification. Right. And it's giving up way too much ground for what was established during the Reformation. Right. And, and the nuances just aren't. It's not in the yeah. in the Declaration. So that that's the difficulty. Yeah. But uh, if you can pick up this book, it's not in print anymore. The, the background papers for this discussion, uh, you have scholars on both sides writing different chapters or articles for this book specifically, and the differences there are clearly seen. And so it, it talks about uh, the Latin fathers, the Eastern fathers, what, what people have meant by justification. There's a lot of good background papers. So even if you, maybe your LCMS, uh, or I almost said ELCA, even if you're LCMS, if you're a conservative Catholic, we both agree that justification, uh, the, those doctrines of just, justification are irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. um, the background papers are still useful to yeah. getting a, a more well-rounded understanding of, okay, what is the history of the controversy? What, how, how can we get to understanding each other better? But the, the joint declaration is insufficient for a doctrinal statement for either of our church particularly because it's not like we, we could take this joint declaration and just put it in there and say nothing else about justification because it doesn't it doesn't parse out the differences it doesn't it doesn't include the nuance of infused imputed right yeah. and that's why that's ultimately why we would say justification is an action of god initially but it's also a process whereby we cooperate with god's grace and grow in justice before him and so and we'd That's, say no. Yeah, you guys would say no, right? And so, anyways, we should probably end this video off here. We might, I mean, we could even just talk about justification next time. We could talk about True. the Eucharist next yeah. time. There's a lot of stuff we want to talk about, and there's just so little time. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I know I kind of went off the rails a little bit, so sorry about that. If it's yeah. a little anathema, yeah, so if it's get a little it. too much. Yeah. Off, no. Well, no, off the rails is in like. Um, off the script that we don't really have. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. Our three-word script yeah. here, justification, Eucharist. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, uh, no, well, we'll have more videos and then when I come back from uh, seminary and yeah. everything. And honestly, just leave leave some comments on more questions yes. that maybe you want answered because I know there were quite a few questions that were posited in the last video. So right. leave some questions and then maybe if you want something in here that's needs to be explained better, I mean, we can probably just get a call going and then record yeah. a video call. Yeah. So we can do we can do videos like that because I want to be able to I want to be able to actually give information that is accurate and right. And there's odds are that there's a few things I probably didn't explain as well as someone like me should. Um, so if there's some nuances there, or you need more answers. Just go ahead and call. Okay, good stuff. Well, thank you guys for tuning in, and uh, we just hope that by our learning of faith, your faith will be strengthened as well. Uh, see you guys next time. Have an amazing day. Peace.